Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Matthew Chiruka. Um, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. I feel like I get it wrong all the time. Uh, Matthew's the uh, Director of Business Development at Vecna Robotics and just an all-around great guy. Thanks for coming on, Matt. Yeah, Spence, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Excellent. So I guess uh, I always like to kind of ask, and I feel like this is kind of a, a go-to question, but how'd you get into the robotics space and I guess what motivated you to, to get into just tech and, and business in general? Yeah, so the um, the motivation's a war story, to be fair. I love um, war stories. I uh, was a uh, just a huge nerd as a kid and um, obsessed with like, you know, Power Rangers and Gundam and all that stuff. But I will say when the first Iron Man movie came out uh, <laughs> and uh, Tony Stark did his thing for the first like hour or whatever, um, I was just like, what's Tony Stark? Oh, he's an engineer. Oh, I need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like so many of us saw that and just. Yeah. I just so, like, uh, oh. I double majored in mechanical engineering and business um, in school and was an engineer for less than a year, realized that I cared more about what I was building, or sorry, why I was building something as opposed to what I was building. It makes a lot uh, of sense. And so I moved more into the um, kind of biz dev product space. Um, and uh, Right around, right around the time that I was graduating college was when um, Amazon bought Kiva Systems and Google acquired eight robotics companies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's quite a year. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, but I, uh, I remember researching the Amazon deal just because that was like a really big deal at the time. And uh, the founders... Um, of Kiva walk through how they came up with the solution um, and how it wasn't based, you know, they weren't looking for a robotic solution before they solved the problem and realized that robots were the solution to that. And I'm not really sure how to describe it, but the light bulbs kind of went off in my head of like how, how robotics could apply, how it was going to change all these different facets of society. Um, and that's really what I'm focused on is the um, the commercialization and uh, go to market of you know new robotics technologies and that's, that's awesome. Kind of since I joined up, so think thanks. No, that's that's a great story. I feel like so many people that that I talk to, especially in the space, you know, they've got like a what is it? They say like a, a nail looking for a hammer, or a hammer looking for a nail. So they've got a tech they've developed, you know, under some government grant or, or research institution. And they're trying to fit it to mar the market rather than what you're describing, which is quite the opposite, which I think is the better way to do things. So. Yeah, I think as the, it, I think some of that is just driven by the fact of like what the history of the robotics field is. You know, it's even now, um, especially in the space that we're in, you know, we do autonomous forklifts and warehousing robots, which seems kind of cliche to probably a lot of people. Not really. It's a pretty awesome tech. I mean, you're pretty much in on the ground floor of it when you consider how many years it's been around. Yeah, no, we were uh, we were definitely newer players into it. Um, kind of veterans now, I guess. But, um, you know, it, it's still such a nation field and it's still so engineering driven and there's no, uh, there's no standards, you know, there's no, um, you've got Ross and some other things, but there's not a lot of like, backing you know the, the infrastructure doesn't exist there yet that makes sense so a lot of people building stuff from the ground up um having to develop all the tools and everything to get that started and so you're dealing with firms that are mostly technologists trying to figure out what to do with the amazing tech they've built and the only reason they've been able to do that is because the government's funded kind of weird <laughs> RP that doesn't apply to the commercial markets so yep because they just want to be able to be more effective at war no matter what the cost. And it might be some niche <laughs> problem. <laughs> or, or getting into space or, you know, whatever entity, you know, or like department. Whatever, whatever it's going to be this time. Yeah, yeah exactly. 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's kind of great uh, for the tech. I mean, when you think about like World War II, right, and how much stuff was developed and, on the advent of that, it's like the microwave, like the precursor to the cell phone with wireless radios. Um, I don't know, radar, um, just just a whole bunch. Of, I guess radar led into the microwave, but like a whole bunch of stuff, really. And so I'm, yeah. I'm missing a bunch of crap, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I, no, I completely agree. The, um... It's, it's still very important to keep that money flowing. Um, and robotics is such an interesting field because it's a convergence of all these different technologies. Like, you know, we're um, even just some of the people that we deal with as like, uh, you know, partnerships with uh, um, NVIDIA and like the telecom companies with 5G and like, yep. you know, low cost computing is coming and like sensors are getting better like the wireless infrastructure is getting better you've got um, data scientists and people with machine learning backgrounds bleeding over from other fields and all this stuff is finally yeah. like, culminating into okay we're finally going to tackle the industrial markets and, I quite like, agree <laughs> D- data science is an interesting one too because I feel like you probably experienced this too being a robotics guy for years I feel like people conflated machine learning and robotics because they watch Terminator and so you know it's just like you know oh you're a robotics that you must do data science like well no I'm, I'm a hardware guy that works on robots you know and not all robots use machine learning you know and so I don't know that was always an interesting one to educate people on um, and kind of fun but you're right I mean these days you're starting to see them kind of merge in a real usable way and it, it's a lot of fun to be alive for so. yeah no it's it's been been crazy being a part of the field for so many years and seeing seeing the change in the market and how investors treat it and how end users treat it. Um, I think one of my favorite headlines from like even two or three weeks ago was when Boston Dynamics released their newest robot and somebody wrote an article where the title was like Boston Dynamics is becoming a boring robotics company. And I <laughs> <laughs> It's pretty fun. But, I mean, they were always that. They were they were like the biggest nerds of all. They just had cool dynamics projects everyone wanted to see videos of. And then, I mean, I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to get in on that back in the day. My, oh, my same. Uh, biomechanics. So, oh, that's, I did not know that. That's awesome. So actually, yeah. you're one of the few other people I've met. I even realized this about you when when uh, we invited you on. I, I also have a double major from undergrad in, in business and, and engineering discipline. So mine's business and computer science. Yeah. As you know, I use computer science all the time today. <laughs> <laughs> so it's purely a hardware guy. I'm more of a mechanical engineer than a computer scientist. <laughs> but, no, it's, uh, I think it's important. Um, it brings a, uh, brings a um, real world perspective in the things makes you not focus so much on the technology but more on the application and you know what lets you focus on the right areas I know? agree did you ever read a book called like The Art of Innovation it was uh, by the GM of IDEO at the time Tom Kelly yeah yeah years ago yeah super I read it like in like I want to say it was like 2003 2004 I was, I was a kid I mean it would have been like <laughs> But that really shaped me, like reading, reading that like as like an early teenager, I think it was like 12 or 13, like, and I was like, oh, this is a way better way to, to invent things than just going from the sake of making something technologically cool. Like think about what people need, you know, and go from that perspective. So. Yeah, and that's, that's what I got hooked on. Um, and to be fair, when I was like in my early 20s, I thought that people needed like, you know, robot suits and um, like... <laughs> mechanical like animals and weird stuff like that but um it's a Marilyn Manson album I think (laughs) (laughs) probably mechanical animals I used to be a fan back in the day I was an angsty teenager yeah I think that's when everyone gets into that yeah that's that's exactly it there's a there's a homework assignment somewhere where it says that like 182 was my favorite band (laughs) nice (laughs) I've got, I think Good Charlotte is, is a guilty pleasure that like when I was in high school, before I had any taste, I, I was really into Blink-180 uh, Blink Charlotte, Good Charlotte. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it was the big thing back then. We were, we were cool, you know, we were on the bleeding edge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hanging out with the skater kids, it was fun. And then that cringy Avril Lavigne song, Skater Boy, that was like big in the 90s, you know. <laughs> 
Yeah. It's so bad. Just, like, and it was like it was like the cheesiest crap. But like, I feel like it was you know it was hip. Yeah. <laughs> it's was, it was, like got a lot of radio play. And then you felt like good like not liking it because it got so much radio play. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. I don't. I mean, I know it's meant to be a tech podcast, but we're humans, so it's fun to talk about the other stuff too. Exactly. What's What's being a roboticist if you can't blow off some steam? You know. Exactly. When I think that's that's the that appeal to a lot of us, right? Is at least to me, and it sounds like to you, is like you said, the fusion of so many disciplines. And I mean, a lot of that, you know, is just being ADD is all, you know, and wanting to keep kind of yeah. trying out different things and. You know, playing in different fields. I mean, SKA. I think. I mean, as you know, I mean, we've worked on, you know, like nuclear stuff. Um, you know, I mean, some stuff in the biomed space. Um, you know, mining equipment. I mean, just like all over the map. You know, entertainment. Um, and so I like that. I like I like being you know able to be nimble and attack kind of different challenges. I mean, it would be great to work on a robot suit. You know, if the world wanted it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, awesome. I mean, <laughs> prosthetics yeah, is like yeah. the closest you get, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember before I joined Vecna, I was like an analyst, and so I um, I studied robotics in like every market. It was kind of crazy seeing all the differences between them. But even at Vecna, um, you know, we've got we've got robots in automotive plants. We've got robots in like retail and consumer goods, DC. Oh yeah robots and parcel hubs and they're, awesome. they're all like on the one hand you're all just moving things from A to B and on the other hand they're all entirely different you gotta learn all these different industries and uh, it's it's been a pretty cool just like seeing and it, it was something I remember saying years ago where like the best robots are gonna be ones that like a couple years from now you don't even think of it as a robot that's know? awesome like you know it's like it's so boring but it's like, like an appliance of society you know <laughs> yeah no that's i mean that's how i look at it and then i guess do you are you managing these accounts actively like so do you get to go to these facilities and, and see what the customers that's cool it's one of yeah. my favorite parts of the job i started as a biz dev rep and i've kind of worked my way up to where i am now so uh did direct sales um still managed some of our large accounts but i am much more involved on the uh strategy and like road mapping and um uh partnership side now you know that's awesome around the technology that's how you know we're in pittsburgh by the way is the trolley sound going by <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah it's nice I quite a bit. <laughs> it's, it's a weird city because it's it's sort of like i mean i think everybody east of us thinks we're like hillbillies and everybody West of us thinks we're Yankee sons of bitches or so. <laughs> yeah. so uh, yeah. not, not a whole lot of love for Pittsburgh, but I, I like living here. <laughs> it's, it's a great city, man. I, Thank you. I remember as a kid, I was never really a huge fan, but... Um, Same, honestly. You don't really appreciate it, I think, when you're growing up there. Yeah, no, the, the renaissance, once it started, and you like really understood what was going on and like going out to... Uh, was it like Baker Square and everything all around there? Like that was that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. And that I mean that was like the last five to seven years. I think that really started. So it was it was really the Goog that got in there and was like the anchor tenant, and then yeah. everyone else wanted an office there, and so that really started blossoming. Somebody's getting well, rich. I think it's Walnut Capital. But yeah, it, I would love to see a lot more VC money going in there for sure. But I think. I mean, what's crazy is that the Pittsburgh Robotics Cluster is bigger and, like, more impactful than Silicon Valley. And all. Well, but Massachusetts is bigger than us, right? And so I think that's yeah. you know, that's, that's the higher... Like, I mean, nobody says that. Everybody, like, thinks Silicon Valley is, you know, this, this sexy, amazing, you know, kind of, you know, beholden thing because, I mean, well, they were. It was a lot of stuff back in the 90s and earlier than that. But then, you know, these days for robotics, you're absolutely right. I mean, Massachusetts, Mass Robotics is, is booming. You know, Pittsburgh Robotics is, I would say, next after that. And then probably we've got Silicon Valley kind of like, you know, I, I don't want to get in trouble with my friends at you know, Silicon Valley Robotics, who I like very much and have a lot of respect for. But that's, I have eyes. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, I mean, facts are facts. And yeah. like, 
Silicon Valley does great stuff and they're focused on different things. Um, but it's kind of wild to think that like Pittsburgh is, you know, the second biggest robotics hub like in the world right now. Yeah. But you guys are the biggest though. <laughs> That's <super cool. laughs> Yeah, I don't want to piss off my friends at the Pittsburgh Robotics Network either. We're, we're sponsoring one of their events right now. <laughs> but <laughs> at the same time, I mean, you know, it's again, I have eyes. I'm not going to lie. That's one of the things I always, that's why, what I want to do with this podcast is just the authenticity, you know, and the, the fact that you can say what you really think, you know, I mean, obviously within reason, <laughs> but, you know, we, we got editors, so we can, we can make it work. But I mean, yeah, you know, you, you, you're right. It's cool to see this old steel town that's kind of gutted. You know, and and did have some some pretty dark times, and you know, I, I don't know. My this is going to be so Pittsburgh of me, but like my my great grandparents like moved here from Russia back in the day, you know, and then my family kind of anchored in. So, you know, I, I had I, mean, I don't know lots of generations of Pittsburghers coming up. My granddad grew up in Braddock, which is you know was like a crap hole for a long time, and is now like hipsters like it, and it's coming up, you know. And, you know, finally, you know, and they got that mayor that's all inked up that everyone seems to like. And then, like, um, yeah, you know, I grew up in Squirrel Hill, which I, I always thought Jews were a majority ethnically as a kid because that's what it was like in Squirrel Hill. Right. <laughs> we were like 60% <laughs> of the population there. So I just no, always that's... assumed it was like that everywhere. <laughs> so. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I have uh, my... Uh, the Russian side of my family settled around Scranton, to be fair, but the Irish, Scranton, have, you know, uh, railroad workers and boilermakers, just that's classic. Awesome. <laughs> that's cool. Uh, and yeah, they're, they're still there. Go out there once, at least once a year, and uh, it's, 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 it's really cool. There's a lot of history there. That's awesome. What part of, what part of, where do you grow up at, like, exactly? Um, well, to be fair, I'm from central PA, but, oh, cool. um, there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, but my family's, uh, in like the Western parts. So like Bethel and, uh, nice. Lebanon. That's know, cool. Whatever. Yeah. I like those areas. Bethel park doesn't get a whole lot of love, but it's, it's sweet. I mean, and property is way cheaper. It's a better place to buy right now. Get into Bethel park if you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, so, ditch shady side. <laughs> yeah, shady side is way overvalued. I agree. Um, and I mean, it was my old stomping ground. Like I grew up in Squirrel Hill, but it, I mean, it's hoity-toity and weird, and and it's like it's been overvalued a long time. I was even looking at places in Lawrenceville recently, and I'm there like, yeah, they wanted way too much money. <laughs> it's just like I don't think this is viable right now. But I don't know. Yeah, I re- I, re- I remember reading stuff about that a couple of years ago when I was like doing a lot more stuff in Pittsburgh and yeah, it was like Lawrenceville was Pittsburgh Gazette's writing articles about like, has it become overblown? <laughs> <laughs> and this would have been like five, three, three to five years ago or so. Yeah, like five years ago. <laughs> yeah. So it was all, yeah, it was already on its way out and it's, it's still, so yeah, they're like shady side now. That's exactly it. So. <laughs> Just the uh, expensive hoity-toity. Uh, they forced out everyone that lived there before because it got gentrified. I have one friend who um, she would she would clean houses like she was. Uh, it's like a janitor and like she was like a high school janitor too, and she moved to Detroit because she just, just was looking for crappier and crappier cities, you know, to be able to afford to live, you know. And good eye, she's really happy there, and you know, seems to be you know content with the move. So that's good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so. Detroit's one of those ones that I'm surprised they haven't. Like you've obviously got the Michigan robotics cluster, but it's been interesting. I don't know as much about that one to be honest. I, what do what do you know? Like, tell me about that. Um, so I, again, I'm focused on supply chain stuff, so I know this these things like the back of my hand. But this past year, just across all markets. Um, was the first year ever that automotive didn't purchase the most robots. Interesting. Was it supply chain, and, I guess, in? Like, a, it must have been something like that. Yeah, it was like the COVID slowdowns really killed the automotive industry, and then the warehousing and supply chain industry just exploded. Everybody's um, ordering all the crap to home. <laughs> <laughs> it, it'll be interesting to see how much that holds, but, like, you know, you think about... You think about what most people think about of a robot that you they usually think of like 
you know, Star Wars or something crazy. Or like Sony Asimo or, or right. Honda Asimo. Sorry, I'm an idiot. But like, yeah. Um, and then they go to, and then they immediately go to like scenes from Detroit, right? Of like, you know, like 20 like, like, robot arms, like yeah. building cars and doing crazy <laughs> I thought you were just going to go straight Ed 209 from RoboCop. <laughs> <laughs> Your 20 second oh. stick and fly. <laughs> That's the first category, to be fair. Yeah. Um, if you're lucky, they think about a Roomba, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah, got him. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, all the, uh, you know, Kuka and Fanuc and all those guys, all their headquarters are around Detroit and all the... That makes sense. All of the biggest integrators in the country are generally, like, either in Detroit or, like, Ohio, you know, kind of like the automotive uh, sector there. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I have friends um, in both those automotive spaces, at least, and, and people I work with uh, almost on a daily basis, you know. Exactly. Um, but it's... It's been interesting with like the move to autonomy, how it's still happening more in the um, the tech clusters of like, you know, uh, you got crews out in San Francisco and you got um, Aurora with you guys. Yep. And, uh, you got Did that dual Velodyne puck action on their cars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For now, until Velodyne. Well, I don't want to get into that. But <laughs> they're not doing good. <laughs> I hope they get out of it. I like their stuff so much, you know, but it's a, it's, it's a weird situation with David Hall over there. Mm-hmm. I haven't been on top of that space as much as I used to. So I, it's all right. I bought stock in Velodyne, which is how I know this, and then lost a bunch of money. So I think the board ousted David Hall is the way that the media presented it, who, mm-hmm. as you know, is the founder of Velodyne. And so um, I think he still has a majority share in the company, which is what makes it really interesting. But I, I don't know it intimately. I just know it from reading the same news articles as everyone else. But, I mean, as a contract engineer, I still kind of have my finger on the pulse. I mean, we have clients in the logistics space that, that tell me some of the things that you mentioned. and I mean, it's it's cool to see, actually. I'm really happy to see, you know, because I think that's the way it's been headed. It's just was, COVID was kind of a kick in the rear. To, to what was coming for a long time anyway, and I think would have happened regardless, you know, is that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it's, uh, I think the best description I read of it was um, it basically took forecasts for 2030 and brought them down to, like, today. Um, <laughs> so it's, like, all the things that we were trending towards, it just, uh, like, you could tell, like, it was kind of heading in this direction, but people were dragging their feet. Like, you know, it was going to take a couple of years for people to get used to it. And this was just a kick in the pants for everyone. Like, it took about three months to get their shit together. And then yeah. it was like, robots, like, now. Yeah, go. <laughs> we need it. We need it yesterday. Get it. We had yeah. one, we had one uh, prospect uh, call us for a user interface on a COVID decontamination robot. They wanted it, they wanted it delivered with, like, working code within a month. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's too crazy even for us. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. man. Wish we could help. <laughs> no, that, that stuff was crazy. You know, the, you know the things we get after where it's, it's still pretty ridiculous, but like, that's, like, that's one where I'm like, I, we can't even. Like, that's too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd love to, but there's within reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give me two months, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's feasible. <laughs> five weeks <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but I, i'm just I, I don't like to i think a lot of our competitors do this and it drives me up the wall like they'll lie straight up lie about like estimated you know lead times or what it's going to take to do something you know and and when you're up against a liar i mean you know and you're telling the truth <laughs> that's not what you can do <laughs> to win when the uh win the respect of somebody that hasn't been burned yet and so you know it's like I don't it's know. uh it is an unfortunate thing in the robotics industry at large that, and I, I'm just going to chalk this up to like business immaturity, essentially. I but. think that's a lot of it too. And I've, I've been that guy before I knew better as well, you know, and you know, you, you grow up. And you got to ride the hypes. I mean, you don't have to, I, I'm taking the, eating those words already, but there's that's, the, uh, that's all right. We're, there's there's the hype one. cycle, right? Yeah. The Garner so, hype curve. Yeah. 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 So there was this, there was this big period, especially over the past couple of years, where like 
people <laughs> can know like, what you're oh like i'm not that impressed and then they got like way too into it and now they're in the like that people are starting to like realize what's realistic i feel like you know yeah um for and, sure like you've seen that a lot with ai i think now is, is people are finally implementing real ais that make sense rather than like vcs just throwing money at nonsense that claims to have an ai in it right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which is secretly an army of people in the Philippines. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no, it's it's uh, it's cloud AI. <laughs> Don't worry about it, guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, AI. Um, <laughs> I, I remember that from years ago, where I was like, "Yeah, but like, does it learn?" And you're like, "Everybody learns." Like, <laughs> <laughs> was that the, was that the really caveat like the VCs would use to try to try to try to feel smart? Does it does it learn? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's funny so is it well and if they I feel like if they really were hip they'd be like is it an online learning system or is it offline trained you know so. it's, it's blockchain learning actually <laughs> in the cloud <laughs> <laughs> that's funny did you uh, so this is probably gonna we're gonna release this like two months from when we're recording it just because we've got a backlog and our editing mm. pipeline is, is sort of the bottleneck here but I'm, I'm, so I'm going to date us and probably blow our cover, but I'll bring it up anyway. We've been following the stuff with Dogecoin lately. Uh, we're recording this in April, late April. <laughs> I have not, no. <laughs> Dude, it's, it, it can drive you insane. I haven't even looked in the last two days, but I just, as a joke with another coworker, we both got like $500 and put in Dogecoin and it spiked up to like three grand. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm just like, holy crap, this is covering my portfolio right now. <laughs> Uh, it's it's one of those things where like years ago if i could teleport back and be like dude just buy a bitcoin and like see what happens you know <laughs> dude i got i got three of those suckers like in, in an account somewhere that i forgot the hash key to um when they were twenty dollars a bitcoin like i i did not invest in bitcoin i just was using it to do some sketchy stuff in high school you know and i have three of them but, you know just uh, all gone whoops you know never gonna see those again it's been current yeah, value. I think like, that what is that like like a hundred and sixty k? Yeah, they're they're definitely six figures each. <laughs> yeah, I think I think they're at like the fifty eight thousand. They're vast lane right now. Between by the time people see this, they'll be six figures. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's uh, ridiculous. It's pretty silly, and everybody laughed. I mean, you're like all oh, these weirdos trading crypto. I'm like, ugh. Gross. <laughs> you know? This is <laughs> Yeah, it's not, it's not backed by the gold standard. What are you doing? You know? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's that way with like all of that technology, though. Like robotics is part of that, but blockchain, AI, computer vision, like IoT, like all this stuff. But I mean, like becoming real you know for so every winner though right like i mean there's pets.com or juicero or like i mean i don't know like it's people say you're naysaying but at the same time there's a whole lot of losers that nobody talks about because they get forgotten yeah, and, oh yeah i mean even there's going to be some serious consolidation in our space within the next like two to three years probably can you are you allowed to say what you think about that or is that going to get us all in trouble um, probably won't do individual names, That's but fair. Uh, um, I will say that, uh, there's a lot of, I have some ideas too, right? That I'm probably not going to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the technologies are starting to become commoditized. Um, and you can't really compete with some of the hardware prices coming out of China and, I think a lot of the, um, we, we call them load decks, but like kind of the giant Roombas or hockey pucks or <laughs> how we think of it, you know? Um, it's just such a crowded space that like there's, on the one hand, it's such a massive industry that there's a lot of room for growth. But on the other hand, like there's too many people vying for the same stuff. And a lot of those solutions kind of have a, they have a performance limit essentially you yeah know? that makes sense so some of the people in that space um i think you'll get the consolidation and they'll start to start pushing into other segments of the market and um, so typically by consolidation I mean companies going to business and buying each other out 
Exactly. Okay. Um, so and it'll be for there'll be aqua hires and like small bits <laughs> of IP, you know, like same thing that happens in every other industry. Yeah, aqua uh, hires are interesting for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when we you uh, acquire a company and engineers. you hire everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what uh, how Amazon did that with uh, Canvas. Uh, I, don't I, remember Can I remember Kiva. I thought that was kind of an aqua hire situation, but a little bit, but okay. there was some, there was more stuff there. Um, Amazon bought another company in 2017, I think. Um, it was like 15 people somewhere in like Boulder. Um, but they, they were, uh, they did 3d slam. They were like pioneers in 3d slam. That's awesome. So, uh, we, we know what they're working on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, amen. I mean, they're not hiding it, right? I mean, like Amazon Robotics is, they've peeped our posts on LinkedIn in a way that's not covert. Like, I think their director of product, I can't remember his name, but he, he followed one of our unmanned vehicles that were uh, looking to maybe commercial, we probably won't, to be honest. It's more of a showpiece than anything, but I probably shouldn't say that, but that's what it is, you know? And so, anyway, um, you know, we, we're, we're built to support other companies. I mean, that's, that's kind of our purpose. But um, yeah, so this, this, um, this person followed that, that vehicle's video that kind of it went like mini LinkedIn. It had like, like maybe like 5,000, 10,000 hits. And um, so like he, uh, he got on the landing page from his Gmail account. And, you know, we were looking at every one of the like 40 people that signed up. There weren't that many. And so, you know, we're like, oh, this guy's clearly had a product at Amazon Robotics. He was trying to be sneaky about it was the funny part, you know? And other people were like, oh, it looks like Amazon. I'm like, you know, they're just trying to spy on us. Like, they just they just want to know their competitive <laughs> landscape. That's it. <laughs> so, I mean, else is getting we, all excited. We, we all do it to each other. To be yeah, of course. Fair. Yeah. Uh, um, that, that, that's fine. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's interesting to see how far they take it. The, uh, the robo maker simulations and some of the stuff they're doing on like the infrastructure side, trying to be like cloud computing for robotics is pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, AWS is, is kind of changed the game and they've obviously got, you know, market share for days. And so, I don't know. I mean, Amazon's doing cool stuff, you know, I mean, we all buy crap from them. <laughs> I mean, I, I, there's a South Park trope about like, you know, you ever, you know, you forget what you ordered on Amazon. It's like, yeah, everybody orders <laughs> so much stuff on Amazon. They forget what they ordered on Amazon. Do, do you remember Amazon in the 90s? Oh, I'm sorry to cut you off. If you had... No, 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 I was just, go for it. <laughs> I was going to say, do you remember like when they were like a book company and it was like this weird thing that like, you're like, what the... Who's who's buying books on the internet? Why wouldn't you just go to Barnes and Noble? This is bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I had a dial-up connection until I was like sixteen or something like that. So I I missed the whole like initial tech wave. Like I I, I might have too. Like how old are you? Like I'm I'm thirty two years old. Thirty yeah thirty one. So we're like the same age basically. So yeah yeah I mean we. Uh, because my, my parents did kind of ritzy stuff. My mom was a lawyer. My dad was a doctor. We got this stuff like a little earlier, but it was still, I mean, basically the similar timeline. I, um, it was just kind of funny when I went to, uh, when I was like going through school and everything, like to me, like tech startups always meant like old school VC, you know, kind of like semiconductors and like biotech and like really like hard tech like big investments risky stuff um and i i misunderstood the entire like internet boom yeah as did <laughs> um, everyone who invested in it while it was going on i think i mean yeah it, it was all like consumer and like commercial oriented stuff um and it's it's kind of stayed that way forever right yeah we're listening to a podcast um where they were interviewing some people from Andreessen Horowitz, uh, one of the big VCs out in the Valley. Um, they were talking about their investment thesis and he was saying like they need like people to really invest in like, you know, uh, green energy and robotics and like uh, 
construction and like all these fields that like have been underinvested in for a very long time, right? I can think of like three companies that hit all those boxes. I bet they were listening to those podcasts. <laughs> well, and it was it was funny because she was like, "So like, what are you guys investing in? Like, who are you investing in in those spaces?" And he was like, "Oh, we do like you know." mobile apps and fintech and I was like so. I shouldn't roll my eyes but <laughs> yeah not not that interested personally <laughs> yeah just it's like we we need to invest in all of these areas of the economy but nobody will actually do it <laughs> yeah well, you kind of get it with mobile apps because it's it's so inexpensive to develop if you just feed people pizza and beer and like let them go and they're and they're willing to do that you know because they they have a majority stake of their company um, like, I mean, I can think of a few VC firms I'm not going to name that that's their whole approach is just apps all day long. But I feel like that's going away. I think the bubble sort of has already burst on that. I hope so. I remember, I mean, even, even Alpha Lab, you know. Yeah, well, that's who I was thinking of, I'll be honest. <laughs> We're getting their managing director of innovation works in here as a guest, so I want to be careful what I say. <laughs> but, that's, that's fair. But uh, Terry's a friend. She's uh, I know her from my childhood. Well, and they got a lot better, but I remember the first cohort, even the hardware startups, they were like, you get like 50K for six months. And it was like... But that was gear. So Alpha Lab actually gave them 25K for six months. Yeah, it was like... Yeah. I couldn't even buy like spare parts to build like a prototype for that much money. You know? Yeah, well, that's exactly it. And like, I mean, we early on were trying to sell into that. And uh, it was tricky because, well, when I say selling, I mean, we consulted for Innovation Works and we we're trying to advise these companies. And I mean, as you know, I mean, SKA early in its career worked with a lot of startups, you know, and so right. um, it was it was unfortunate because, I mean, you build these relationships over and over and over again. And then the companies run out of money through no fault of their own. I think they're underfinanced a lot of the time. And, you know, I think of a lot of these entities, you know, and it's not just innovation. It's, it's a lot of other ones as well. But, you know, I think if they just picked, you know, like less, they were more selective and then they gave a larger amount of money, they would be more competitive with their picks. Yeah, no, I, don't, I don't blame Innovation Works at all. I think they're limited by the institutional investors. And That's it. And it's the state a lot of the time, too, because they, they, they're subsidized by, I believe, Pennsylvania. Right. So, yeah, it's, that, that's the part that I blame. It's like all of the... All of the um, LPs that fund the VC firms are giving their money to people that are investing in like mobile apps, you know? Yep, yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're only, what was it like? Some crazy statistic like 80% of all VC money goes to California, New York, and Boston, and like <laughs> over half of that is in California, so it's. Who stands a chance, you know? Well, that's it. So, like, I, I, I know plenty of people who, who raised money with Alpha Lab gear or Alpha Lab and then moved their companies out to the Bay Area because there was just so much more financing. So they gave away, like, what was it, 9% of your company for 50 grand for six months. And also mm -hmm. you get, like, legal advisement and accounting and, like, SolidWorks discounts and stuff like that. Right, and, the, the machine shop. Yeah, and then lots and lots of pizza and, uh, and Chipotle. <laughs> And so, yeah, exactly. And then all that stuff. And, um, you know, and then you do that and you sort of get recognized. And then when you're on the radar, you know, like a seed round in Silicon Valley is like 500,000, you know, for the same thing. So you get like, yeah, I mean, I've seen companies get accepted by Innovation Works and then turn it down for Y Combinator or companies do Innovation Works and then get angel funding in the Bay Area. I mean, you've seen all this too. Like, I don't know why I'm telling you, like, you don't know. Uh, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's good to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I, I think these, these honest conversations are important. And I mean, I don't want to throw VCs under the bus because, again, I have a lot of friends and, and, you know, just close, you know, business colleagues where, you know, I don't want to get, you know, <laughs> shoot myself in the foot here. But, you know, I, I think, like, there's just, it's like you said, I mean, people follow the hype curve. You know, they're like, you know, I'm, oh, that's, that doesn't sound impressive to me or, Oh, that's awesome. Oh, we got to be putting more money into blockchain just because everyone else is doing it. Oh, I got to. I've even had, like, you know, ah, I don't want to get into that, but, you know, like, <laughs> you, know you, you think somebody's going to be impressed with, like, some really good work, you know, and, and they come in and, 
they're expecting to see one of those buzzwords there when there when there isn't and, and you don't have the heart to lie about it you know you're just like yeah that's not what we built this for you know let's yeah i mean i i, I don't blame them too much um because you know they're also under a lot of pressure to get those returns it's like 20 percent a year their investors are expecting right which is pretty high it's, it's, it's not they, in this market but normally know, yeah it's why they get that whole 10x uh that whole tax thing, you know, where they just preach it and pound it. Um, and it's, uh, the whole system's just got the wrong incentives right now. That's really what's going on. I agree. On. Well, I, I had to leave an event one time and I, I won't say, you know, what organization or who it was, but it was, it was in a venue and at the venue, it was, it was like a, a place that was normally reserved for concerts. And so, mm -hmm. um, a certain person that ran a certain VC firm said, um, you know, Let's, um, this is a venue made for rock stars. Um, and that's what all of these people are. These were startup, uh, CEOs. When I think of a CEO, I think of a company with at least a hundred employees, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, at that point you've earned the right to call yourself a CEO. Like I would never dream to call myself a CEO with a company the size of SKA, right? It just doesn't make sense. You know, but he's still running. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. People don't figure it out for a while. It's actually kind of fun. So, you know, because my title is director of product development, a lot of people assume there's just a C-suite above me and it's actually really, you can sort of scoot it under the radar in a really kind of nice, pleasant way. I mean, it's, it's, I don't have that big of an ego anymore. I used to, but mm -hmm. these days I much prefer like the low key, you know, just like, let me slip under the rug approach. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I know I'm good at what I do. I don't need you to necessarily recognize that unless I'm trying to sell you product. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a better way to live, I think. Yeah, that's, that's cool, man. I agree with you. Yeah. For sure. I, uh, I always appreciated my extra titles. It, it helped me do my job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, when I used to work at Deep Local, I forgot about this, but I was, I was hanging out with their former head of operations, uh, Kristen, if you ever met her. So she's, um, she's cool. I, I like her a lot, but apparently I would go on the phone and, Nathan, the CEO, I mean, all my NDAs are long since expired from this company, but, you know, <laughs> Nathan, the CEO then and now um, would, would basically uh, say, you know, what was his wording? And he was like, uh, I was like, Nathan, what's my title? Because I was an intern. <laughs> and he was like, uh, just see, whatever gets the job done. I don't care. We just make up our own titles here. And so going to Chris, I forgot about this. We were having a martini the other day. She goes, yeah, you would go on the phone and be like, hi, I'm the director of business development for Deep Local. <laughs> As an intern, <laughs> the title you've worked your your butt off to get it back. <laughs> so just make it up and pretend to be that. I don't know. I mean, again, I'm not proud of this. You know, again, it's not who I am anymore. But I was so full of crap in those days. I would just tell people I was that to get the desired result. Yeah. We're, we're older and wiser, and there's some gray hairs coming into our beards. So oh, for sure. <laughs> people know people. People can tell from talking to you, you've been around the block too, you know, that's uh, just having the, uh, being able to talk shop with people is like uh, so much of it. I, yeah. Honestly, that, that was the funniest part about my industry is like having to learn all the different buzzwords across different industries. You know? I kind of like, wonder now, cause there's gotta be, I've, I've worked with a few logistics companies, but clearly not as many as you. And so there's got to be some ones that are universal across like the big ones, you know, that you, you see over and over and over again. And there's got to be other ones that are proprietary, I would think. And you can't say which ones are proprietary, but you could probably say which ones are universal. Yeah, there's, there's not too much uh, proprietary, but it's uh, at the end of the day, it's just how much stuff can you move and how little is time as possible, right? It's like, <laughs> well, that's every automation problem ever since the yeah. beginning of automation. And how little can you can you screw up while you're doing it? So what is it? It's reduce cycle time, reduce scrap, and there's like, you know, reduce expense. So a lot of times that comes at the expense of manpower, which is a thing that robotics people try to hide, but it's the nature of the beast, you know, fortunately or unfortunately. I think it's a good thing in the long run. I mean, because, you know, I don't know, it's, it's all progress. It's all progress, um, um, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of 
a lot of robotics companies learned and also a lot of the general public has come to realize is the benefit of humans for the um, edge cases and exception handling and all that stuff of like, yeah. you know, this thing is really good at its job like 98% of the time, but it's really good to have somebody that like knows what's going on and can just quickly like, you know... <laughs> Um, yeah, I've got I've got certain things I can I've seen that you've probably seen too that neither of us are allowed to mention, that that exemplify that pretty well I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's it's crazy too. Like, um, you know, pe people always worried about or people always talk about robots displacing jobs and stuff, but it's more it like for us it's really supplementing like temp labor and people that like aren't going to stick around and it's like the guys who have worked in that factory for 20 years yeah just know everything you want about. those guys around because they're they know it better than anybody else exactly they're they're so worth it um and they're just so smart and so good at what they do that like if you can make their life easier and have them focus on like applying that knowledge um that's really what it's about that's awesome that's a great way to look at it and I'm very compelling like i've sat through so many talks you know and you have too about you know how robots are not a threat to human just outright denying it but i think the argument you just put forth it makes sense to me i mean that's that's straightforward that's logical that's honest you know and, and you're right you're doing a good thing you know so yeah no it's yeah i, I think more people will come around to it um you're getting like small doses of automation even with uh just like tools that people use in their day-to-day -day office jobs and they're like oh yeah this makes me like better at what i do and i don't have to waste time with all this admin work and yeah like expensify like, oh. versus like a manual expense report from back in the day is a good example of that or just yeah, like a mileage tracker you can run on your phone. You know, those are apps. I know we how we feel about apps, but at the same time, you got to give credit where credits due. I mean, you know, those guys change the game, and so no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so yes, yeah, I, I think people are coming around to that a lot more. That it's it exists to augment people and make them better at their jobs and take care of the the dull things that they shouldn't be worrying about. You know. Yeah. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, yeah I dig that. Cool. But there's every once in a while someone cites like that Oxford study from like 2011 where I'm just like, oh. <laughs> what, what was that study? So tell me about that because I've seen a couple yeah, of us. It's a very old, uh, very old study from two economists where they In jolly old England. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They, they estimated something of like, you know, like 47% of all jobs would be like completely automated by like, basically now, you know? <laughs> nice. Uh, and uh, it was one of those ones where like when you dug into it, their like definitions of both jobs and like automated was very... Uh, Academic. Um, loose, you know, yeah, makes sense. And so there have been all these studies disproving it uh, that have gotten like you know published since then and like gotten a lot of traction as well. But it's just a headline grabber, so people <laughs> still suck it to this day, even though it's like been what? Dis dif yeah. Well, there's a bunch of those, right? I mean, there's a bunch of studies that just get quoted incessantly, even though they're wrong and they've been disproven. You know, but people still go back and look. And when there's studies too that are in favor of, of our perspective, which is automation, that are also wrong, you know, and fallacious. Right. <laughs> and so it's, it's, I don't know, people, I think, will just make up whatever suits their, and this sounds very cynical, but I don't know. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that going around. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's okay. The insert big three, you know, consulting group here said so, you know, it's so like, that's fair, yeah. <laughs> the so-and-so yeah. corporation, the such-and-such -such group, <laughs> this, that, and the other. You know? so, yeah, it's yeah, pretty funny. So, one of these days we'll figure it out, but I think, I think in general people are coming around to the idea of it. Yeah. And, uh, 
hopefully we can just keep up the momentum and some of the work that's happening in our space will start to spill over into you know other markets and make investors bullish there and we can finally uh it's one of those you know rising tide lifts all ships things it's yeah. like you know if we have some successes out by us and there's successes in cali and successes with you guys and even if they're all in warehousing that means that you know a year or two from now all the money's getting poured into agriculture and energy and everything else that we need to do um, all the stuff that we have money into and lost <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll go back up i think i mean i haven't i haven't sold any of those positions yet but yeah it will uh yeah. but I, I agree i i think um i mean it all uses robotics and robotics is so universal and the work translates i mean that's what so many people don't realize is like have you worked on you know this in particular thing you know and, and what is that old sales joke right and it's what is it like um you know, somebody goes into a sales conference and, and they say, um, you know, somebody, there's an interested prospect, like, well, you have experience selling, you know, frozen produce. It's like, well, as a matter of fact, I do, you know, and well, what about lettuce? Well, absolutely, actually, yeah. Uh, whole leaf or chopped? <laughs> 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 Lost it. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. It's on the nose. Yeah, you laugh for a reason. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's very yeah, real. No, that, that, that stings. I'm still in it. <laughs> no, I have been burned like that too, right? I mean, we've we've had prospects be like, have you worked on, you know, and it's just so narrow. It's 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 almost like they just don't, they, they don't have the balls to say no, you know, <laughs> so they want to <laughs> make you say it, you know, and so, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's, uh, that's part of the curse of, I think, how automation has worked to date too. It's like, I, maybe, maybe you remember this from like back in the day too, of like, you know, I thought I was told my future in robotics was you were going to go be a field engineer and like, write, You know, inverse kinematics, ladder logic for this crazy application which is really difficult to do in ladder logic am i from experience it's not what it's designed for at all oh it's the worst Um, (laughs) you've had to do it too oh Oh, i hated it like every second so bad yeah yeah well it's 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 funny because it was meant to be intuitive all that stuff these graphical programs they were meant to be easier but to somebody with a programming background it's so counterintuitive just give me that code block like let me let me just write c into this sucker you know (laughs) But I think uh, I think for years people were so used to custom solutions, you know. Yeah. But just uh, now we exist in that world where yeah, it's it's exactly like you were saying. It's like, well, can you make a robot to do X, Y, and Z in this environment? You're like, well, no, we've never done that. But I mean, it's within our wheelhouse, or you know, the. Dude, you're insane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that doesn't seem feasible. Dude, you're insane is what I wish I could say. <laughs> that's me. It's... Well, that's what happens up here. Yeah, industry. exactly. And it gets translated into well, you know, given current market conditions and the state of technology, that's probably not the most feasible goal. You know, yeah. this end, so. I wouldn't recommend starting there, but. <laughs> but you know, yeah, you throw all of the money in the world at it, and maybe. <laughs> yeah. We can. We can hire a couple of smart people and work on it for <laughs> an indefinite amount. I mean, you try not to, I mean, but you, people do their own. I think that's it, right? So you, you have to inform and, and offer your expertise and, and, you know, due diligence, right? And say, I wouldn't recommend it. Please don't do that. You know, that seems like a bad idea. But at the end of the day, if somebody wants to go down a path that doesn't strike you as, I don't know everything, like there might be something that is viable that you know, it doesn't seem viable to me. And I, I, as a consultant, I can only advise, I can't dictate. I mean, that would be fascism, you know, it, would, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't make sense, you know? And so, you know, yeah. it's like, yeah, I advise against, but if you want to do it, I mean, we'll help you, you know, take your best shot at it, you know, I mean, the same way we do anything else. And then, you know, you get behind your client's vision. Yeah. And I think, uh, again, as more people become educated, they understand what the limits of, the current R and it, that, that goes to both sides. There's been plenty of examples of, uh, you know, 
um, end users or um, people who wanted to integrate the technology that thought it was going to be easier than it was or, oh, or, yeah. or came in and said, yeah, we can do that. And then they got burned. And likewise, there's, I mean, there's still problems out there that people have been asking to solve for a couple of years. And it's like, you know, I'm sorry, guys. Like, it's just, it's not there yet in terms of like, delivering what you want why well, i think people appreciate that right i mean if you're honest with them and, and you can you can deliver bad news but but do so in a way that's that's at least prompt you know and yeah and i i found it's always better to either steer people towards like you know somebody who can do what they need or to just yeah be up front and say look i honestly don't think you're gonna find this if you do that's great and like, tell me I was wrong, but yeah. Uh, when well, we've had that conversation with prospects, we've ended up not working with before. Where we've said, look, I would advise against anyone that says they can do that because they're probably lying to you, you know. And and like, please be careful, you know, because you may get hurt very badly. And and I don't want to see that if if I can help it. But you're gonna do what you do anyway. So like, tell right. me if you find it, obviously. But I, I would advise you heavily to consider alternative paths. Yeah, and that's, again, it's a maturity thing. And uh, I think as more and more, more and more companies in our space start to mature, they'll realize, like, you know, what will start to get more uh, collective sense of, like, this is what's feasible, this is what's yeah. not, you know? Everybody always gives the counter examples, though, like the, the companies that, that flourish. I mean, like, you know, Steve Jobs, if he had listened to people had said, if Henry Ford had listened, he would have built a faster horse. You know, and like all this stuff, you know, and I don't know. I think those outliers are going to keep that alive forever. Like, I don't think people are going to collectively, you know, it's probably good that not everybody is, you know, sensible because we do need those people that are insane and actually get it right every, you know, 0.2% of the time or whatever it ends up being. I'm sure that, that number's made up, you know, but I'm sure it's something like that. But. No, you're, you're 100% right. It's the, uh, you need... You need the visionaries, you need the people that kind of keep you grounded, and then you need the people kind of in between that kind of pull you more towards the visionary. Yeah, side. well, I think, I think you and I try to be those in-between guys. I mean, like, we don't always get it right, you know, and, and we're never going to because we're human. But, like, you know, the idea of, like, look, this is my experience, this is what you're trying to do, maybe consider this path somewhere in the middle, you know, <laughs> Yeah, and hopefully you can you can help somebody out and, and help a company earn some money, and and that's I think like you said that's what it's all about. I mean, you know, so just making yeah. people's lives better in some way. You know, and I don't know. It sounds cliched, but <laughs> yeah, no, keep a keep it honest and uh, do what you can. And sometimes we're wrong, and sometimes it's uh, <laughs> so wrong. No, no, you know. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, like, that's the thing, like, when we get under bid or, like, another company, you know, it's easy to be, like, they're lying, and, and I know I said that earlier in this very conversation, but sometimes they're probably not, like, I would imagine at points, and this happens with the younger guys a lot, like, they, they, they think they can, you know, and, and, you know, it's just because they haven't tried yet and, and failed on that, or maybe they actually can, like, sometimes, you know, it's, our first big project we got was highly unrealistic, I mean, we got sort of uh, rolled, if you will. <laughs> like it was, you know, I mean, lucky it was an inexpensive role. I, I spent like $7,000 of my own money and um, I'm not going to even say the name of the company because that would not be good form. But um, this company asked us to do a thing in, in an amount of time that was not realistic to do that thing and with the amount of money that they had for that project, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so um, we tried very hard to do it and, um, you know, I... I physically had to restrain a guy that was started speaking in tongues because he was, he was telling the truth. It was an engineer and I'm just like, Hey, so we're going to be able to meet this deadline. I felt like, you know, like the great leap forward deluxe over here, you know? And I was like, we're going to be able to meet this deadline. And he was like, Ooh, like, Ugh. and he just, he just started talking gibberish because he was having a psychological break and I had to physically, it really left a mark on me. I had to physically lift that guy by like his elbows and like carry him to his bed you know, and, and just like, you know, just tell his mother, you know, and, and it was, it was rough. Jeez. Yeah. And I mean, that, that'll always be with me and I'm never gonna, 
but it, you know that's that's important. That's that's a, that's a good lesson. And I mean, I could I could hug the guy, and we're still friends, by the way. I might add, you know, but I, I could hug the guy for that because it taught me, you know, kind of the limits of human endurance, and that you can't just push past that because you're going to hurt people, you know. And so, I mean, we've had projects recently where we've had people working like. <laughs> As you know, SKA has a lot of people working, you know, as subcontractors, and, and that's a big part mm -hmm. of our business because we have really smart, just high-value people, and we pay them very well, you know, to do, you know, difficult challenges. And so, I mean, these people often have other work they're doing, and so we, we sub-see them in. Um, and so, um, where was I going with this? I, I, had, I had a point, and it's, it's swimming away. The guy <laughs> was speaking in tongues, uh, had a oh. caring get burnout or something like that oh yeah okay thank you and so recently we had somebody and and they were showing the signs and, and you can tell like you know as an experienced man you can probably tell when someone on your team is close and you, you got to give that person a little bit of you know breathing room or you're going to lose them forever you force them to take pto yeah yeah exactly you know you're just like look just dude just get out of here you know like just take care of yourself even if it's a woman dude get out of here <laughs> like take care of yourself <laughs> You know, like, do, do what you got to do. Um, like, just, just, you know, fly to the Thailand for, like, a couple of weeks. Like, just take care of yourself, you know. And, and yeah. you, know, you, you have to or you're, you're going to lose brilliant people that are, are contributing to your team, you know. And yeah, it's, it's important to remember at the end of the day, it's about the team. Um, you know, we're, we're working on some crazy stuff. We're all working on crazy stuff and we're all building towards this crazy future we can see but like you gotta yeah you gotta take care of your own and you gotta make sure that uh the people you're working with are yeah. uh keeping their sanity and, oh yeah because they're know, useless to you without it and, and you're a bad person if you encourage them to lose it and so yeah, there's just, just many reasons you're all pulling in the same direction so yeah. make sure you all do the self-care portion as well <laughs> yeah, absolutely well that's been hard for me at times so i mean i feel like you know as a small business owner, I mean, I, it's so easy to just, you know, work yourself past the point of no return. But, you know, I mean, then you realize, like, no, you've got people depending on you. You can't do that because, you know, that wouldn't be fair to everybody who's relying on you. <laughs> like, you have to take care of yourself, too, because, yeah. you know, this, this is a valuable tool and, and people need it to be working for, for them to glean the value they've paid for. So, yeah. hundred percent. Yep. Cool, man. Well, I think that's a good angle to end on. I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel like that's that's a good message. No, I think so. It's uh, we've uh, we've both been working on uh, both been working on the you know robotics startup kind of like small company get stuff out of the lab and into the real world for years now. And oh yeah, uh, it's uh, it's a cool space to be in and. You know, it's, you work with some really incredible people and you work on some really cool things. And, uh, yeah, we're just going to keep it going here. <laughs> Amen, brother. See what uh, see what impact we can make, you know? Yeah, doing the best we can. <laughs> cool. Hey, if you like what you just saw, please smash that like button, click subscribe. It's your support that'll let us keep doing this. We can improve our production value, start releasing these more often. The more people like it, the more of these we're going to put out. So if you like it, subscribe, tell your friends. Thank you so much. You're the best.